Hey guys, Cajun Cardboard coming at you from the great state of Louisiana. I'm excited to bring you a little impromptu during the week video off of our regularly scheduled programming uh, to uh, kind of focus on a really cool topic that I ran across. It just popped in my head one night while I was sleeping. Woke up, got to the office early and decided to put this together for you all. It's, uh, it's five iconic basketball photos from NBA history. Um, so... Uh, again, I'm not saying these are the top five. I'm not saying these are the five best, but these are five that really mean something to me. I just wanted to talk about and share with you. Some of you younger guys that watch my uh, YouTube channel may not um, know much about what we're going to talk about today. You may not care, but these old guys like me, if you're in your 40s or in your 50s or 60s, you're definitely going to identify with a few of these pictures that kind of tell a uh, pictorial story of the history of the NBA and how we got to where we are today. So we're not talking about basketball cards today. We're just talking about basketball and we're going to talk a little bit more about the history of basketball um, as depicted in these uh, in these photos. So I've got a slideshow for you today here. We're going to switch over. Uh, I did five uh, iconic honorable mention pictures for you and we'll talk briefly about each one. Uh, the first one you're going to see, uh, everybody, no matter how old you are, should recognize that photo. That's the Michael Jordan fist pump uh, from Game 5. It's called The Shot. Anytime your photograph or your, your one shot uh, has a name and the name is The Shot, it must have meant something. So, uh, ironically, Jordan also hit another The Shot in college to win the national championship for his North Carolina Tar Heels uh, down in New Orleans at a game my parents actually attended. Um, but uh, this the shot was in game five against the Cleveland Cavaliers in a first round playoff game. The game was played at Cleveland um, and a lot of people don't know this but uh, Jordan had 44 in that game and there was actually six lead changes in the final minute of the game. So imagine that six lead changes in 60 seconds this being the last one. It's just a, it's just a shot that will live on in the history of the NBA. Uh, Jordan has two uh, NBA shots that probably stand out from all of the others along with a million different types of uh, million different dunks that nobody else has ever seen or done before but uh but this was the first the shot uh, a little sneak peek there may be another the shot coming up for Jordan in our uh, in our five most iconic photos on my list uh, but picture number two here you're gonna see is uh, Doc's reverse layup Doc's actually gonna make two appearances uh, in this video today the first one here is is the famous reverse layup that Doc had in the 1980 NBA Finals um, he had come over from the ABA where he had absolutely dominated won multiple MVPs um, he, uh, he, you know, the ABA, NBA merged. And so a lot of you guys, if you're younger, you never really got to see the best of Doc. He was an incredible NBA player, don't get me wrong. Uh, but you were catching him uh, a little bit towards the middle to end of his prime, uh, whereas most of the damage he did was in the uh, super exciting ABA with the red, white, and blue ball. But this photo that you can see on your screen here, um, he's, I think that might be Mitch Kupchak. I'm not sure. Uh, but it's definitely Kareem down there who's groundbound. He's going up to try to block it on one side, but Doc jumps from outside the lane. Uh, I don't even know how to describe it. He, he palms it like a grapefruit, sweeps behind the goal, and flips it in on the other side. If you haven't seen it, go find it on YouTube. It's, uh, it's one of the most amazing plays. Certainly at that point in history, it was maybe the most amazing play anybody had ever seen, other than maybe Doc Duncan from the free throw line in the ABA dunk contest. But uh, the Sixers went on to win this game in the 1980 NBA Finals, but the Lakers, uh, Magic and Kareem's Lakers ended up winning the series 4-2. to two. So uh, that's another honorable mention. The next honorable mention you're going to see down in the bottom left, no, that's not a typo, that's not a mistake, and that's not a joke. Uh, it's just a photo that has always stood out to me ever since I was a kid. I just can't wrap my brain around it because what you see in that photo is a 7 foot 7, 200 pound Manute Bowl and a 5 foot 3, 136 pound Muggsy Bogues. Uh, Muggsy Bogues, to put it in perspective, is smaller than my extremely thin uh, high school sophomore daughter. Uh, and he was an extremely successful MVP, NBA, NBA player for a decade and longer. Um, uh, always a pest on defense. Gave 150 million percent every time he played. Uh, Manute Bowl was, uh, was a, a legend of the game. He just impossible to look at and not just your jaw drop. 
Uh, ironically, he never took a three-pointer in his first three years in the NBA. And then his la in his next year, his fourth year, he started chunking threes. He would sling them from above his head. Of course, nobody could get to his release point. He was a terrible three-point shooter, but nobody remembers his misses. They only remember his makes and uh, and maybe scratch their head when a seven foot seven dude was chunking threes from the top of the key. Uh, sadly, Manute Bull died at age uh, 47 in 2010. Um, his claim to fame was that he led the league in blocks two times. Uh, he blocked five shots a game as a rookie, which is a staggering number if you go look at today's game. Obviously, it's changed a lot. But uh, another stat that a lot of people may not know about Manute, he had more blocks than points for seven straight years in his career. Let that sink in. He blocked more shots per game than he scored points per game for seven straight years. Um, Muggsy, on the other hand, will forever be linked to the anybody can do it phrase. Uh, if you're 5'3", 136, and you can succeed in the NBA, especially back in that era when people beat the shit out of each other, um, you know, the refs did not protect anybody. You could hand check and guard and put forearms and two hands on people and move them around as a defender. Uh, for Muggsy to be uh, super successful and uh, a teammate that everybody wanted on their team in that era really says a lot about him. A lot of people oftentimes kind of link uh, Muggsy Bogues with Spud Webb, but that's a misnomer. Spud Webb is actually three inches taller uh, than Muggsy Bogues. I mean, that's like comparing... Uh, you know, uh, Russell Westbrook to LeBron James, right? Uh, so Spud was significantly taller than, than Muggsy Bogues. Muggsy Bogues, a lot of people don't know, old people like me do, students of the game will know this. He played on one of the greatest ever high school teams ever assembled. Uh, he played with, uh, there were four NBA players on that team. This was before the Oak Hills and the Montverdes and the IMGs existed. So this was back in the era, guys, where high school teams were actually kids that went to high school there. They weren't imports and they weren't prep schools and, and academies and things like that. His Dunbar High School team went 59-0 and in a two-year stretch. And his teammates were Reggie Lewis, who tragically died, who was an NBA first-round pick. Reggie Williams, who played in the NBA and at Georgetown. And David Wingate, who played in the NBA and at Georgetown. Town. All three of those guys were extremely, extremely good basketball players and uh, all better than average NBA players as well. So um, that's just a little uh, little tidbit about Muggsy and Manute. The next picture you see, everybody's going to recognize this picture uh, from the photo shoot during the 1992 uh, Dream Team uh, Olympics in Barcelona where they won the gold. Uh, it was the first year back for pro players where they came back and uh, and took on uh, the other countries. They dominated everybody. I don't need to talk too much about it. I think this is the photo where Magic said you can't touch Michael uh, in these photos because it might be called a foul. So, um, but this photo is just great because it, you know, it symbolizes the passing of the torch. That that Barcelona Olympics truly was the passing of the torch where Magic and Bird finally said, took a deep breath and said, you know what, we're done. We can't do what he can do, and he's just beginning. And uh, they nailed it. Um, he he ended up being obviously the greatest of all time um, by most people's standards. So this photo just kind of. You know, means a lot to me for sure because I remember that year. That was my senior year in high school. I remember watching every second of every game, including every single exhibition game. Uh, I've, I've watched videos of the practices and the pickup games. And if you've never seen the documentary, The Dream Team, for God's sakes, please go find it uh, and watch it start to finish. It's fantastic. Next photo is, um, is an iconic photo for a little bit of the younger generation, right? And so these are for the big LeBron fans, the LeBron over Jordan type guys who, who like to make that argument. It's just a photo, uh, you know, showing Dwayne Wade's obviously behind the head alley-oop, uh, the showmanship, the flash, the just athletic superiority of both of those guys. Um, you know, people like to say the Heat were the first uh, super team, um, but uh, that is definitely not the case. Uh, they are the first manufactured super team where uh, players sort of – uh, forced their way onto the same roster uh, or had enough power and freedom in uh, in the modern NBA to force their way onto the same roster. But I assure you there were super teams long before them. Uh, in fact, you just looked at, you know, a couple of names on there, Jordan, Pippen, Rodman, uh, Bird, Mikhail, Parrish, uh, you know, Magic Johnson, Worthy, Kareem. So super teams definitely predated that team. Uh, but uh, but that was uh, that is definitely the, the super team to remember from that era. And that photo is just a great photo, just showing how wildly athletic those two guys were and how in control and on a string they had the basketball. Uh, totally dominated games. The, one of the greatest, you know, 
one of the greatest teams that's, that's ever been assembled for sure. Uh, but okay, so that's enough. So let's let's move on. So number five on our list is going to be a picture that's actually not a picture of an NBA game. <clears throat> it's a picture that's always meant a lot to me, and it is this picture of when Doc visited Rucker Park. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know how much you guys know about street ball and playground ball, but uh, you know, in Rucker Park, uh, that's probably the most notable playground uh, pickup game in the world. Um, not just anybody can walk on there and just start hooping, especially back in the 70s and 80s. But this is a pick of Doc rolling out there when he was in the ABA in the 70s. And if you can kind of zoom in, I don't know if you can, look way back in the top left. There are literally people that is probably 45 feet off the ground with their legs dangling off balconies. Um, if those people fall, they're dead. That's how important it was to see Doc play against their playground legends. Um, so this is just an amazing photo of Doc, and in the background you just see thousands of people who have just showed up. There are no sidelines. They've literally got their feet hanging over the side. Um, you know, the, the rumor has it, well, it's not a rumor, but uh, I guess it is a rumor. So rumor has it that in 1971, Doc showed up at the Rucker, and uh, uh, about this many people or more showed up and, and got any eyes they could get on the court because he played against uh, Joe the Destroyer Hammond, who was a playground legend uh, who used to run Rucker Park and dominate Rucker Park. Rumor has it uh, the Destroyer put 50 on Doc in a half and they did not finish the game. Uh, so believe it, don't believe it, I don't know. That rumor's out there, but there were a lot of great playground legends in the 70s and early 80s who definitely could have played in the NBA, but whether it was cocaine or just attitude or just, you know, whatever the case may be, they just never got that opportunity. You know, Pee Wee Kirkland, Joe the Destroyer Hammond, uh, the helicopter, you know, there's a bunch of guys out there with uh, with nicknames who played pickup ball that definitely uh, could have uh, could have thrived in the NBA, but chose to play pickup ball instead. Um, so Doc was everybody's hero, right? Doc was everybody's hero who's age 55 to 70. Um, he's a little before my era, but certainly he was my hero just because it's the greatest nickname ever, or one of the greatest nicknames ever. But but if you're age 55 to 70, Doc was your guy, you know? Um, you know, you couldn't really identify with Kareem. Doc did things nobody had ever seen before. If you're my age, you know, probably four, early 40s to early 50s, you're a Jordan guy, right? Jordan was your guy um, that, that you reminisce about and that you collect and that you, you know, you talk about and you consider the greatest ever. And then, of course, you've got the guys that are in their 30s and in late 20s who identify with LeBron, you know, and that's, uh, that's, you know, it is what it is, but it's just, it's fascinating to see that transition, you know, of superstardom. Anyway, uh, that's picture, uh, picture number five. So picture number four is again, I told you there was going to be another Jordan, the shot, and this is the other shot, uh, Jordan's last playoff shot. Okay. So, uh, this was a photo taken from the 1998, um, you know, playoff game, playoff NBA Finals against the Jazz, Game 6. As you know, Jordan never went to a Game 7. Uh, not only did he never lose a Game 7, he never went there. Uh, so this was Jordan's sixth and final championship. Uh, it was the second year in a row they played the Jazz. It was the last, last playoff shot of his career. If you haven't, you know, ever seen the last 60 seconds, if you're too young to, you know, to remember that or you never saw it the first time, he actually stole the ball from, uh, you know, all-star power forward and, and NBA legend Carl Malone at the other end. You know, then he comes down, he isolates, he knows exactly what he's doing. As usual, he's got the entire game in his hands and the ball on a string. He gets an ISO with... Uh, Brian Russell at the top of the key and then, uh, you know, drives to his right and then does a pullback and then allegedly pushes off. I want you to comment. Was it a push off or not? I don't care if you're a LeBron fan or Jordan fan or a Jazz fan. Tell the truth. Put in the comments below. Yes, push off or no push off. I say it's not. It wasn't significant enough of a push off. He would have created that separation anyway to get the look that he got. Uh, as you can see, he's about six feet away. So uh, Jordan got exactly what he wanted. You know a shot is, is you know, uh, historic and iconic when Jay-Z has a lyric. I'm liable to go Michael. Take your pick. Jackson, Tyson, Jordan, game six. Uh, he's talking about this shot right here. Uh, so if Jay-Z is writing lyrics about one particular shot that you took and made in your career, you are, uh, you are unique and uh, the I word applies, iconic. So that's photo number four. Photo number three is, uh, and this is hard for me because I'm a huge Wilt guy, right? I've always been a Wilt over Russell guy. Um, but, uh, but this is a picture of Bill Russell and his 11 rings. Um, you know, I, I think 
the younger generation is forgetting about these guys, the Russells, um, and the Wilts, and even even uh, you know starting to get to Kareem and, and Doc. I think uh, the younger generation needs to go back and look at some of these guys and what they did. Uh, I, I'm not saying that you know Bill Russell would be able to uh, get on the court and, and handle Joel Embiid, but you've got to compare players to their contemporaries in the era that they played in. That's how you determine greatness. You look at their resumes. You don't look at, oh, he couldn't play now. That's not the way it works, right? Um, so for that reason, you know, I've got Russell's picture here with his 11 rings. Nobody's ever done it. Nobody's ever come close as a player. Uh, you know, Phil's got <laughs> Phil's got his share of rings, but nobody's ever come close as a player. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but in 58, Russell could have won his 12th ring. This would have been obviously not the last the last ring, but he could have won another ring, which would have been his 12th in 1958, but he hurt his ankle uh, and it ended up costing them the title. Comment below if you know who won that. I'm not going to tell you who it was, but I will say this is the only Hall of Fame player that won an NBA ring during the Wilt and Russell era, right? During the era that Wilt and Russell were both in the league, they won every single ring between the two of them. Uh, with Russell getting 11, except for this one dude. I'll give you a hint. He's a white dude. And I'll give you another hint. He sits uh, near me uh, at, at LSU basketball games here in Baton Rouge. So that is the only Hall of Fame player to win a ring during the combined Wilton Russell era. Um, but, you know, Bill Russell's, you know, meaning and, uh, and influence on the game of basketball uh, far transcends what he did on the court, as crazy as that sounds, because he was so amazing on the court, um, you know, from a race relations standpoint, just from a, an awareness of race issues, you know, Red Auerbach embraced Bill Russell like his own son. Um, you know, he took him under his wing. He, he, he snatched him in some tricky maneuvering to get him in some kind of weird territorial draft or whatever because um, he knew what he saw, right, at San Francisco when Bill was getting 57 rebounds a game. So uh, he even made Bill Russell a coach. He, uh, you know, he coached the Celtics, for God's sakes, after he retired, and he was a player coach for, uh, I can't remember, maybe a year or two. Um, and ended up coaching the Celtics as well. He's obviously for a long time, for three, four decades, been an ambassador for the Celtics, but now he has transitioned into truly being an ambassador uh, for the entire NBA. Um, I think if you go poll guys like LeBron and uh, you know, Giannis and uh, you know, Co you know, even Kobe used to talk about it and Jordan, if you ask them who the father figure of the NBA is, I promise you uh, they're going to point straight at this man that you're seeing on your screen um, as that guy. So uh, I know he's getting up there in years. Hopefully he's doing well. Hopefully you've got a rookie card of Bill Russell somewhere in your collection. If you don't, that's something you should probably look into because uh, he's done a lot for the league. Uh, picture number two, uh, easy for me, right? Because this is uh, my early, early childhood. This is who I grew up watching, right? So this is Magic versus Larry. Uh, this is, uh, as you see on the screen, this is the NBA's greatest rivalry. No matter what anybody says, this was the greatest rivalry in the history of the NBA, dating all the way back to, uh, to Russell Celtics, who we just talked about. Um, this is black versus white. This is uh, urban versus rural. This is style versus substance. This is east versus west. Uh, this is athletic versus not so athletic. I mean, I can go on and on and on. It's half court basketball versus up tempo fast breaking basketball. Although the Celtics fast break a little bit more than people realized. Uh, people like to think of them as a bunch of slow white guys and a slow Robert Parrish, but that was not always the case. Those dudes got up and down the court. They just didn't do it at the same clip as the Lakers, and they certainly didn't finish with the same flair uh, over the rim theatrics as the Lakers did. But um, these two gentlemen that you're seeing on your screen right now, they saved the NBA. So for those of you who are too young to remember, um, the NBA really sucked in the 70s, to be quite honest with you. Kareem dominated everybody. Uh, the ABA existed, so there was a little bit of pull there. The, you know, the NBA was losing talent to the ABA. They, then they had the merger. Then there was a little chaos. And then the C word, right? Cocaine. Uh, cocaine was a big freaking problem in the NBA, y'all. Um, it was uh, it was a big problem. It affected the performance of the players on the court. Uh, it, it affected the duration of the players' careers. It derailed numerous careers of what could have been NBA mega superstars. Um, so these guys came in and they wanted to freaking hoop, man. They wanted to hoop and. Uh, and uh, they met, obviously, in college, as you guys know, uh, in the uh, NCAA Finals where Magic got the best of Bird because he had a significantly better team than Bird did at Indiana State. Um, and uh, so th these were the first two super teams of the 80s, in my opinion. You know, the Philadelphia 76ers had a really nasty team with Moses and Doc and them uh, and Andrew Toney. Uh, and Mo Cheeks, but but these two teams were the true super teams of the 80s. 
you know, winning eight eight rings between the two teams. You know, Magic had five, Bird had three, um, and these were uh, actual you know super teams that were created organically. They they weren't players forcing their way off of one team onto another onto another. So. Uh, Everybody in the early to mid, even late 80s, was one or the other. You loved Magic in the Lakers, or you loved Bird in the Celtics. You were never both. You never met anybody who was both. Everybody was one or the other. And uh, I wish we could get back to that type of, of feeling in the NBA. But um, unfortunately, I think player movement has kind of, um, while it's been great for the players and player empowerment, and um, you know, and it, and it brings a level of excitement and, and new hope, so teams aren't terrible forever. Um, it does eliminate that that sense of identity that you have. Like, I, I mean, Dirk Nowitzki is the last player that I can remember that just stayed with his team forever and took money. You know, he took discounts on his contract and whatnot. So, um, I think those eras are over. But uh, two of the greatest teams, the the two greatest teams of the '80s, and then the you know the focal point of both of those teams, super mega stars that saved the NBA and then handed it over to. Uh, I'm gonna skip over the Pistons because I don't like them, but uh, handed it over to Jordan. We're just going to pretend the Pistons era didn't exist. So sorry if you're from Detroit or if you love the Pistons. Uh, shout out Ryan Scott. Um, anybody, uh, anyway, let's move on to number one. I don't know if you guys can guess what number one is. I've given you a little bit of a hint. I told you I'm not, uh, I'm not a Bill Russell first guy. I am a Wilt Chamberlain first guy. So iconic photo number one on my personal list is Wilt Chamberlain's picture holding up the 100 sign. There are so many uh, facts, rumors, legends, um, you know, espoused about this game that took place in 1962 in the Hershey Sports Arena. Um, you know, it, it, let's just start talking. So in that game, he uh, Wilt broke five other records. Ironically, he broke the record for the most free throws made. He was a notoriously terrible free throw shooter. He shot 61% from the free throw line that year, but he broke the record for the most free throws ever made in an NBA game. Uh, in that game. He had broken the scoring record earlier that season in 1962 when he scored 78. Okay, so when he scored 100 here, he broke his own record. In that season, in 1962, he averaged 50.4, 25.7 rebounds, 40 in 48.5 minutes. Let that sink in. Think about that. There's 48 minutes in an NBA game. He played in 10 overtime games. So he averaged 48.5 minutes per game. Take that for load management, Kawhi Leonard. Um, that is preposterous, okay? He didn't miss a single minute of playing time that entire season. And he's not flying in charter jets. He is taking buses, he's taking trains, and they're not suited for seven foot three guys, right? So um, he probably also blocked close to 10 shots a game. The NBA did not keep track of blocks that early uh, back in 1962. Um, I, I've, I've seen some data where they put together footage and they've kind of tried to extrapolate. And, you know, we can talk about Russell Westbrook having the, the all-time triple-double record. Wilt Chamberlain would have 500 triple-doubles if they kept track of blocks. They said that he averaged over 12 blocks a game in one season. So that's 80 right there. Um, nevertheless, uh, that's enough. So in that game, in the fourth quarter, the Knicks players were pissed, okay? Um, they started fouling other players to immediately get the ball back. Basically, hack-a-shack. For those of you who got to watch Shaq play, they started the hack-a-shack. But they weren't fouling Wilt, the, you know, who was a notoriously terrible free throw shooter because he was on fire that night. They were fouling other players just so Wilt couldn't get to 100. And they stalled. They literally held the ball at half court. There was no shot clock, right? So he scored 100 points in a game with no shot clock where the other team was trying to keep the ball away from him by fouling his teammates and putting them on the line, and they were stalling the ball. It wasn't televised. Uh, no video exists of the game, period, okay? Um, wouldn't it be something to go back and watch it so we could kind of uh, eliminate any doubt and, and move some of the remove some of the fog about what transpired that night in 1962? I would just I would kill to be sitting in that arena. There was only 41, 24 in, ascend, in attendance. 4,000 people were in attendance. I've played games in college with more people in attendance than Wilt Chamberlain's 100-point game. That's nuts to think about. Um, audio recordings do exist. I can think they were discovered like maybe in the late 80s. They actually discovered a full-length audio recording of the fourth quarter. And that's how they got to verify some of the some of the things that we've just talked about. Um, but, you know, and again, in true Wilt fashion, the night before he was partying with some girls um, and dropped them off at 6 a.m. 
He caught a train to Philadelphia from New York. He was partying in New York City, right? Probably at, at one of the clubs in New York City. Dropped his girl off at 6 a.m. in New York. Caught a train to Philly. Arrived at 8 a.m. Then took a bus from Philly to Hershey. So they were playing in Hershey because back then the NBA was losing attendance. College basketball was actually taking priority. They were losing attendance. So they would play, Philadelphia would play home games in smaller cities to try to draw fan interest outside of just the city of Philadelphia. So Philly actually played, this was their fourth home game in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, if, if you're wondering why they didn't actually play the game in freaking Philadelphia since they were the Philadelphia Warriors back then, uh, later to become the Philadelphia 76ers. But um, so they played the game in Hershey and Wilt was, you know, hungover, uh, had a monstrous lunch, uh, rumor has it, and then went out there and dropped 100 on them. Okay, and so now I want to address an issue. This is what everybody says when they when they hear Will Chamberlain scored 100 in a game. Oh yeah, but he was playing a bunch against a bunch of little white accountants, right? He he was playing a bu against a bunch of uh, six foot tall white dudes who couldn't play basketball. Not the case. New York Knicks started a 6'10 and a 6'9, and the 6'10 was one of the better defensive players in the entire NBA, Daryl Imhoff. So don't listen to the bullshit uh, of people saying you know Wilt didn't play against anybody. That's not true. Okay, um, the average height of the uh, of the average post man in that era wasn't that much smaller. Uh, and 100 points is that much greater than anybody else has ever scored. I mean, it's 19 more than Kobe scored in his crazy 81 game. Uh, so when, we, when people score 50 now in an open game where you can take as many shots as you want and you can't touch people, people score 50 and we go ape shit. Imagine somebody scoring 100 points in the game. He scored 100 out of his team's 160 or so. Uh, anyway, that's it, guys. That's my photo number one. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Like I said, some of my videos are not just going to be about basketball cards. And, uh, and I felt like I was doing a little bit too much content on ultra modern stuff. So I wanted to go back and, and put a little uh, historical uh, NBA stuff in context and give it out here to you guys. I would love, I'm sure I'm going to get comments on this because there's, Literally, there's like 50 photos that I looked at that I could have chosen for these lists. And, you know, I know Muggsy and Minute aren't two of the greatest players ever. So they're in my honorable mention just because of what they mean to me. But these are my photos. These are the photos that matter to me. Comment below if there's some photos out there that matter to you. And uh, maybe I'll go back and I'll do the top 20 uh, NBA most iconic photos uh, at some point in the future. But I really appreciate you guys listening. Uh, I'm glad you stayed to the end. If you're a subscriber, I can't thank you enough. Thanks for all the kind messages you guys send me about the content and that you're enjoying it that means a lot and that keeps me doing it um uh, if you haven't subscribed yet hit the subscribe button it should be in the bottom right of your screen right now it's real simple just click it hit subscribe and then hit that little bell icon uh if you haven't done that yet because i drop videos like this all the time but i also have regularly scheduled videos that come out every week and so i want you guys to know when those videos do first uh do first release so again thanks so much um appreciate all of you guys watching uh keep collecting stay positive in the hobby and peace